But first I want to talk about what I call the hidden tax in your 401k. People talk about investing via their 401k because of the tax advantages, and let's face it, uh, under the current tax rules, you can put in up to $15,500 a year, including employer match, uh, into your 401k, and it isn't tax, which is equivalent if your marginal tax rate is at the lower end, it's equivalent to getting 25% bonus on your money. And if you're at the highest tax bracket, then it's equivalent to getting 35% bonus on your money. So people talk about you know, 401ks as being a great way to invest, but what you have to realize is that uh, it's not the 401k that you're investing in, it's the underlying assets that the 401k is using that is really your investment. The 401k is just a vehicle to get you there. And the usual assets that you're investing in via a 401k are mutual funds. And what you may not realize is that there's a hidden tax in mutual funds, and the tax is quite severe. Uh, for example, there is a, uh, and a hidden tax, just to let you know what I'm talking about, is really fees. Most mutual funds have fees. And there's an uh, organization called the Division of Investment Management. And I'm not sure exactly who they are. I think they're a quasi-government body. But they do a report every uh, year. And, and the last, one of the reports that they actually did do was in 2000. And it was called a report on mutual fund fees and, ex and expenses. And I'll have a post coming up sometime soon that this video will be attached to to show you where to find that report. But if you Google report on mutual fund fees and expenses, you can find quite a long report. And it found that uh, mutual funds across the industry they surveyed, and they surveyed many, many, many of them, the fees on those averaged 1.88%. And what's even more worrying, those fees have been going up slightly over the years. So some of those costs are up front. So to come up with the average loading, they had to consider the time frame that you would hold on to the mutual fund. So they chose five years. If you held on to the fund for 10 years, then the uh, rate actually dropped to about 1.52% because you're spreading those fees across uh, a longer period of time. But the interesting thing is that uh, the 1.88 or 1.52% only really applies if you don't add or take away from your mutual fund during that period because the part that you add on or the part that you take away, you're obviously not holding for as long, so your relative fee is even higher than the 1.88%. So just keep that in mind. But assuming that you buy a fund today and hold it for the next five years, then effectively on average you'll be paying the fund manager a fee of 1.88% for most large managed mutual funds. Now what the report found is that a 1% increase in the fund's annual expenses can reduce your ending account balance after 20 years by 18%. So think about that. If your fund is 1.88%, it actually reduces the fund by much more than 1.88 times 18%. It's actually more like two to two and a half percent. So it's more like 20, uh, 35 to 45%. So that's the hidden tax in the fund. That means that the fees that you pay, which seem small up front, actually compound, and that's the issue. You're compounding those fees over 10 or 20 years that you're going to hold that fund, and usually the 401k it is for that period of time. And when you remove the money from the fund at the end, you find that you're losing quite a bit. And in fact, there's a book that somebody asked me to read, which I did buy, and it's called Spend to the End by a guy named Scott Burns. And just uh, it's about something else, but just in one part of it, he also talks about the same issue. He talks about the fees. In fact, he, re he uh, refers to the same reports that I referred to. And he said that if annual expenses in funds were just 1.4% instead of 1.9%, after, say, five, after, say, 10 or 20 years, it's like the equivalent of being hit by a tax of 35% on the fund, which is the highest marginal tax rate around. And what he also found was that, that most managers who are managing funds, and why, why do we pay these fees? I mean, you might say, well, I'm paying the fee of 1.4 or 1.9%, because I'm buying the expertise of the fund manager. They can do a better job than me. And maybe they can, but the problem is this. When you look at the performance of funds over time and compare them to the market movement, say in the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, those funds lag behind those indicators roughly by the amount of the fees. In other words, what you're paying the manager of the funds is wasted money. Something else that was interesting that Scott Burns found a study that Yale professors did of some uh, budding MBA students at, uh, and I think it was another university, 
and they offered them four funds to choose from and most students put their money to two or three of the four funds. The problem was if you looked at the prospectus and even gave them a one page summary, each of those funds invent, invested in exactly the same types and mix of stocks. So there's actually no difference in the funds, yet the fees between the funds vary dramatically. Some were very low, some were very high. So even though you buy a fund with a high fee, doesn't necessarily mean it's doing anything other than a fund with a lower fee might be doing. So Scott's advice in his book is simply to go and buy the lowest possible cost fund you can, which is obviously a low cost index fund like a Vanguard fund, where the fees can be as low as 0.1 or 0.2 of a, of a percent. So rather than paying 1.9%, you might be able to get a fund that pays only 0.1 or 0.2%. As far as I'm concerned, that's fine. There's no issue with that. But the bigger problem is this. You may invest in the fund, but Scott found that the real return of these index funds, even with a 0.1 or 0.2% of fees over, a, say, a 20-year period of time, the real return after inflation was about 9%. 9.1% but take off your 0.1% fee brings you to 9%. So the, real, the reality is that if you invest in an index fund with low cost to try and keep up with the market rather than paying high fees, uh, you're still only getting a return of 9%. Now of course if it's in your 401k, it's tax advantage 9%, so you might consider it to, to be equivalent to a non-tax advantage 12% fund, which is great. And because you're getting the employer match, but remember that's only year one, over 20 years I did an article that shows that amortizes to only about a 1% or 2% increase in fund returns. So you may end up with a real return in your 401k if you, if you get 100% employer match and choose an index fund and get the 9.1% and get a great tax advantage. You might end up with a, with a quasi real return of 14%. And that's fine, but the question I have to ask for you is this. Will that 14% return get you to your financial goals? Which is simple enough to do, find out compound growth calculator online, have a look at how much money you're investing now, how much money you want to make when you retire, and how long that's going to be, and it will tell you if 9.1 or 12.1 or 14.1% will do the job. For most of the people watching my videos or reading my blogs, as we found out by doing some exercises recently, that won't do the job. So you've got no choice but to invest outside of index funds, outside of mutual funds, and therefore outside of your 401k. Maybe you can invest in a Roth IRA, and maybe then you can invest in property or gear into stocks directly or into other funds and borrow money through a Roth, that's fine to get some tax advantages, but the basic principle is this. If the 9.1% return or the 14% return, if it's in your 401k, does the job for you, fine, stick with the program. If it doesn't do the job for you, you have no choice but to look somewhere else. To find out where that somewhere else might be, please visit my blogs at uh, 7million7years.com or 7m7y.com or visit ajcfeed.com or ajcfault.com and all of those will be up on your screen and just find some good old-fashioned advice. No scams, no schemes.